minute I met Bill, I knew that this was a guy who would change the world. I was seeing a man who had so many facets, a, 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 a quite literal diamond. He made you want to be as good as he thought you were. I mean, he would give you such faith that he believed you could do anything. He was wicked smart, uh, scary smart. When you're with Bill, you always had his full attention. Um, you knew that he was, his mind was completely on whatever topic you were on. Whatever you were doing was the most interesting thing in the world. He's had one of the best investment minds I think I've ever come across. Um, I don't actually know when he slept. I don't know how that worked. I first met Bill when we both started as first year students at Stanford Business School. And what struck me about him was that he had a dog-eared copy of Benjamin Graham's uh, famous book on value investing. So he came to business school with a real intent to create himself out of the mold of Benjamin Graham and Warren Buffett. My dad exposed Bill and I to two great thinkers that had a big influence on our lives. The first would be Aldo Leopold, who introduced us to the idea of the land ethic and that as people we're part of a broader community and that a critical piece to that connection is a love of all of life. The other person would be Warren Buffett. Before Bill was a teenager, my dad had started investing with Warren Buffett through Berkshire Hathaway. He was brilliant. He won the accounting prize in his class at Stanford GSB, something he wanted no one to know about. What I have loved about Bill was he just enjoyed life. And he was so talented, probably the smartest guy in our class, and so gifted. Um, and again, made it seem effortless, but you knew he was working hard. He was always someone that was incredibly generous with his time. I came to the school as an ex-military officer wanting to get into the investment business, and Bill was one of the mentors I found here. We admit a small number of students who we hope will become change agents in the world who are going to change lives, change organizations, and change the world. Uh, and Bill Israeli uh, you know, was one of those people. Well, beyond doing a great job on tests and case discussions, he had tremendous intellect and was just a great human being. I had the chance to stay in touch with Bill because of our passion for national parks. And he, uh, over the many years, um, shared stories and trips into the national parks and, and became somebody that I would come to, even though this is my field, my profession, working on national parks, I would come to Bill with questions. Help me think this through. When we were students together in the Stanford Business School, we did an independent study on the timber industry. And he, as he always did, was a voracious consumer of everything and anything ever written and embraced it. I, I thought it was interesting and kind of moved on. And it turns out a number of years later, I discovered that he had found what's now become the largest timber company in the United States. One of his very best investment ideas for the firm, not going chronologically, but probably the most exciting was Calpine Corporation, which we still own today and is our largest investment. A uh, large utility that at the time was going through the early stage of a bankruptcy. Uh, we bought the bonds. Uh, we wound up owning a nice piece of the equity of the company. Bill oversaw that whole process he had extraordinary judgment, and extraordinary instincts for people and for businesses, but he was also very, very intellectually honest. And uh, he, he never let his head or his heart outweigh the other. He um, could be demanding as well um, by always coming back and focusing on that intense rigor of investing and things like dispositive negatives or finding the, the expression of the idea. Again, there's some great phrases that, that in fact do endure. Bill was the chairman of the California Academy of Sciences and he led a really successful capital campaign, a half a billion dollars, to transform that museum and build a whole new campus. At the same time, I was the chairman of the Exploratorium and we were doing a very similar thing. Every day when I wake up, I think about Bill and he's sort of my guardian angel for fundraising. He put his energies, his resources of all sorts behind what he felt was important. One area of great importance to him was, of course, people and education and the natural world, and those topics are exemplified in this institution. He had a total commitment to excellence and a remarkable ability to bring out of others the very best that they have. He um, called upon me, I'll never forget that call, 
Randy, I need you to to lead all of the opening festivities for the new academy. I could never say no to Bill. He um, he just had a way about finessing sort of the, the, the ask. Bill, more than any other single person, was responsible for transforming the Bay Area Discovery Museum from a small kind of local uh, resource for kids into what, is, what it is now, which is a national model for children's museums. And it was really two things. One is he spent literally years, over two years, negotiating a long-term lease. And then he chaired the My Place by the Bay capital campaign, which raised $19 million. And I'll never forget Bill's incredible smiling face and his intense interest in coming on a board of a nonprofit organization that was dedicated to three of his passions. And they were, um, of course, his love of nature and caring for the natural environment, his passion for creativity and the arts, and of course, his love of children. Bill and his wife, Libby, endowed a professorship in honor of Bill's 25th Harvard College reunion, where they were able to bring together their strong interest in the environment and in sustainable, clean energy. He would remind you just by the way he interacted with you and the kinds of discussions you had around the gift of why you were doing what you were doing. He would remind me why I was a fundraiser. You felt like you were on a quest for good working with him. I think Bill recognized that if you were to do one thing that would really change the lives of people around the world in the environmental field, it would be to make sure that everyone had adequate, safe drinking water and also basic sanitation services. What Bill was able to do was articulate in a way that I could understand was the connection between the business case for the environment and the environment itself. And I think that was really important because it allowed us a tool, it gave us a tool, it gave us another way of thinking about sustainability and how to achieve it. So we went fishing at a place called Rising River, and the fishing was very difficult. And, um, and I was having lunch with some of the other fishermen, and we were commiserating about how difficult it had been, how we'd caught no fish. And Bill came back uh, about 20 minutes later with a big grin on his face, uh, and then proceeded to tell us in a very humble way uh, how he had actually been successful and had caught a fish. I saw the picture from it later, and it was you know good. 24-inch uh, uh, trout. I came to Bill for an interview, brought a cup of coffee. He asked me an incredibly insightful question. Of course, I knocked the cup of coffee over, spilled, went everywhere. Bill sat back, looked at me and said, you know, Ian, I always wanted to get new furniture. Classic Bill Patterson. And watching Bill ski was really something quite special. Like many things in life, it looked effortless, but if you looked closely, it was very precise. And he was uh, a racer by background, always the first one down the slope, but somehow he made it look easy. And it was our running together that I loved the most. It was during these runs that I often asked his opinion and guidance on some decision I was working through. He would always listen intently and provide thoughtful, clear, and objective advice. It's a race that we would often do together, the Dipsy Race, which is a grueling race from Mill Valley to Stinson Beach. It involves seven and a half miles and, and almost 3,000 feet of climbing. And it's a handicapped race so that Bill would always start, because he was younger than I was, a minute or two behind me. And seemingly, always in the same spot in Hogsback Ridge, in a very steep spot, I would hear Bill say, way to go, Matt, you're really looking great. And then he would run by me. He just had a gift, and he was such a communicator in, in um, just a, a wonderful, warm, embracing way. So you were sort of drawn into him and wanted to work hard for him. And, you know, be kinder, be a better person. You know, the thing that really stood out for me with Bill was balance. Each of us strives for excellence at work, with family, in the community. And often we have to make trade-offs among them. Somehow Bill managed to find that balance in all three of those areas and excel in each. 
Um, Bill was really, I think, um, a special, special person because of the, the way he treated the people around him and the way he stayed connected to the people around him. So I'll, I'll always remember that Bill um, was a devoted person um, to model my life after. I still remember Bill at one point grabbing me and saying, you know, I hope you never miss an opportunity to open a nice bottle of wine with friends. He said, because at the end of the day, the scarcity in life is really time. And we're all likely to have fewer of those windows where you have an hour or two to sit down with a good friend and have a conversation about any topic than that nice bottle of wine. In leaving so early, uh, Bill gave a gift to many people around him to make each day that we have count. And I think if we could talk to Bill, he would, he would say, hey, you know, learn from my experiences and make the time that you have count.